you know, it's funny. Uh, a lot of research is going down cul-de-sacs. So Mike and I went down this cul-de-sac trying to trying to make a a weaker monad. Uh, which we can do, um, but it doesn't solve the problem that we were trying to solve. <laughs> um, let's see if I can find it. Here we are. Um, so, Greg, when you say weaker monad, what uh, exactly do you mean? So, instead of having a multiplication that's on the nose, uh, here you can see. Uh, you have a multiplication that's associative of, you know, you've got some natural transformation that that gives you associativity. So rather than rather than uh, you know rather rather than equal, you know, so the the mult is not the, the pentagon and triangle equations. For associativity are not equations. You've got you've got an uh, you've got an associator that you need to put in place, like this. All right. So, so you've got. I see. So you got you got a natural transformation. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, um, and a modification alpha, which is going to. Which is gonna give you the give you the um, the the shape that you need, right? You can get from one shape to the other, but it's not it's not on the nose. And the same with the identities, really. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, so that doesn't quite that doesn't quite uh, do the job. Um, but it turns out it turns out. Uh, we can still get what we want. Uh, just trying to find the page here. Where is it? Here it is. Okay. So what we really, what we really want is a is a notion of is a notion of um, negation that generalizes the kind of negation that uh, uh, that you get uh, from uh, sets. Uh, so it's it's not the sort of it's you know, but it's not generalizing it in the way, for example, that uh, intuitionistic negation generalizes it. Um, so so the idea is, let me just find a page here. Suppose I have a. Suppose I have some type constructor. Say, oops. Which I'll write down as a functor. Okay, I have some type constructor. Um, and I guess I guess I should call it T. Okay, so I've got some type constructor. Then what, what I'd like to do is to poke a hole in it. Okay, so that's uh, that's that. And and then uh, find a location. So that's that. Right? Um, so since I'm writing it that way, it needs, I need to go ahead and do this. And the delta is binding tighter than the application. Okay. And, and then what we want is that um, uh, delta, oops, oops. We want that uh, delta t uh applied to the t we've got in our hand so that's this one 
uh, sorry, sorry, it's the sub T, right? Uh, so let, let, let me do this, let me do it a different way. So suppose that uh, K for context is equal, is, is in uh, delta T of X, okay? So I've got some context. And suppose that uh, my little t is equal to k of t prime. Okay, so that's the situation that is represented by this type. All right, so let me let me make this at the type level. X other than the instance level. Okay, so. So that's a location, right? Uh, so I've got a pair. So that would be K and T prime. And suppose that T is the, the term you get from applying the context to the T prime. So this thing is, um, uh, uh, that's the, this, this is the context and that's the sub, that's the piece of t that it that is surrounded by the context so when that is the case then i can i can say that the complement of t prime is going to be everything in the context that isn't the t prime so in other words k of some zero okay that's the con complement and so then anything, so, so then all we have to do is we have to insist that T is not a monad plus, but just that T comes with a zero, right? That's, that's all we need. So instead of being a monad plus, it's like a, it's, it's not even a functor plus, it's a pointed functor that comes with a zero that I can stuff in the, in the context. Uh, and that that that's all we need in order to. Oh, we also need, of course, that t is a that t t is differentiable, right? Which is a pretty heavy demand. So t has to be differentiable, which basically means it's sort of polynomial. And then uh, and then we and then it comes with a zero. Uh, it could be like a t plus, right? So a functor plus. So you could you could also have the addition, um, but uh, uh, but you you have to at, at a minimum have the zero. And now we can define a notion of negation. And in fact, we can define a whole power object, right? You can, you know, it's all the different ways you could split up. Uh, it's it, all the different ways you could split up t. Right, so so in, in fact, it, you know the, the power object is going to be, um, it's the it's the uh, uh, let's see, Let, let's call it uh, I don't know capital T. No, that doesn't work. Uh, Gosh darn it, <laughs> I am out of ASCII characters. Uh, let's, let's call it T plus, okay. So T plus is going to be, <coughs> it's going to be the T, it, it's, it's, uh, oh, let, let's write it, let's write it at the type level, that'll be easier. So the type of the power object, is this thing. Oops, like that. So it's all the pairs, right? And it's all the pairs such that when you apply the context to the um, subterm, you get T back. 
right? So we collect we collect them, and then that gives you a that gives you the uh, the notion of power gadget. Um, and when, go ahead. Um, uh, when you say that uh, for t uh, you want to have uh, empty or, or zero, um, why can you just say that uh, k has some kind of notion of empty hole? No, is that it's not it's not k right? It's got to be the t. Mm -hmm. k, but k, even uh, I'm, I'm thinking k that, is uh, k, even if it, k is the instance, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking that uh, uh, this zero is not directly related with t. That, that this can be some other uh, s prime or uh, whatever, and zero is still the same, right? Or or not? Z the the zero is constant, right? But it's a constant mm -hmm. relative to t. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. T is our initial input, mm -hmm. right? To the to, so, to the. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm, I'm thinking the not not t prime uh, negation of t prime is uh, basically just the context without t prime inside. The, yeah, no, 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 no. You can't have a hole in it. You've got to fill it up. Mm -hmm. You got to make a T, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? It can't. This not T prime is of type T, not delta T. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we want to fill the hole with minimal yeah, you something that is basically nothing, right? Exactly. You fill the hole with with mm -hmm. something that that gives you no information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the only information is whatever was left after you've taken away the sub gadget. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm still a, a little bit struggling with, uh, um, uh, with the Delta T. Um, I know that you, explained this multiple times and also with uh, with uh, Brian you, you you were talking about that and um... it's just you know like the the simplest way to, to see this is uh, in a grammar wherever you have a non-terminal you replace it with uh, a hole right so Mm -hmm. So, uh, so this means all all possible constructors that are using that are non-terminal, right? Yeah. So remember, we have zero or you know um, or y from from x p or output p oops or whoops okay or uh p bar i'm not using q for a reason p or uh star x. okay oops okay so there's there's our grammar, right? So now what are row contexts? So row contexts are, uh, there's the hole, right? And now, uh, I can put a hole there, I can put a hole there. I can put a hole on the left side. Since it's commutative, I'd, I, so if, if par were non-commutative, I'd have one on the left and one on the right, mm -hmm. okay. right? But since it's commutative, it doesn't matter, right? And then uh, star x doesn't matter, right? There's no, there's no non-terminal p in there, right? So that's it, we get rid of that one. There, that's all the context. So that's delta P. Mm -hmm. I see. 
and zero is a, zero is a hole, but a, no, zero is not hole. We, we we got rid of it. Uh, we got rid of zero, but we have to have a place to start from. Oh, uh, this is like a um, uh, fault filled hole, which is uh, a constant. No, no, it's the it's the it's the context that that, that has no surrounding area. Oh. So like this this has some surrounding area, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so in general, like if you've got some polynomial, it will follow the derivative. You've got some polynomial functor that's, you know, it's made up of taking sums and 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 uh, 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 you know products and co-products, right? Mm -hmm. Then it will follow exactly the rules of the you know ordinary high school derivative. Mm -hmm. I see. So this this for example is p squared, right? So we would get, you know, two p. That's why you get a left and a right. But it's not two p. Uh, it's uh, because, uh, you know, you 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 get. So two p mm. is, you know, I see. yeah, right. Is is the sum of a p and a p. Uh, but because this is, yeah. So, I mean, I strongly recommend reading uh, Connor McBride's paper on the derivative of a polynomial functor. That's very straightforward. Right. I mean, it's, he mm -hmm. explains it incredibly well. Right. I know that uh, you, you previously said that, and I was looking at this paper, but uh, I should definitely now look uh, again because I have like better uh, better view. Okay, yeah, it's it's, mm -hmm. it's very straightforward. And so so now you know we we've got everything we need, but like the last thing that was missing was was a was a negation. So now we now we've got a negation, um, and that allows us to do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, right, so so now we can write down those formulae that I've talked about. Uh, uh, so anyway, so that's uh, that's fairly straightforward. I do have one other quick fun thing to talk about, um, which uh, so you know a, a while ago, long time ago, like over ten years ago, um, I described how you can do uh, graphs. Well, in particular, I was looking at projective geometries that where, where, where there's a graph associated with the geometry. So I described how to do uh, uh, graphs and, and geometries as process terms, right? And you know, lots, lots of people have shown how to do graphs as process terms in various process calculus. So it's not not particularly uh, shocking. Uh, I mean, the, the fact that, that you know I chose a graph, I chose a class of graphs that are projective geometries is mildly interesting. But what is really interesting is the fact that, so in the case of the funnel plane, um, the, in order for the in order for the geometry to stick around, the the process has to evolve back to itself. Uh, and this is remarkably like the way chemistry works, right? So any persistent chemistry, any structure in chemistry has to refresh itself. The, uh, um, because, you know, in solution, you know, there are lots of other things that would, that would like to, uh, that would like to, you know, ha have the molecules that are used to create the structure that is there. Uh, so, so this, uh, this fact is quite interesting, right? It shows that shows that process calculi, you know, behave much, very much like chemistry or biology or the lower tiers of biology. 
Um, so, uh, <clears throat> um, we could apply the same trick to a lot of other mathematical structures, not just graphs. So for example, imagine I have a set P like this, okay? And it's, it's full of processes. And now imagine that um, for all P that's in, in this thing, um, let, let's imagine first of all that, um, and let's say for all P Q, all right? in that we have that uh, uh, P par Q. Okay. Uh, it's not working, dot, I have to put the dot here. Par, so P par Q is in P. All right, so it's closed under composition, right? But also, Let's, let's also imagine that for all R, P par Q goes to, after some, num after some number of steps goes to R, implies that R is in P, okay? So it's not just closed under composition, it's closed under evolution. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, all right, so it's, it's, it's a collection of processes, but it's a collection that is closed under parallel composition um, and is closed under uh, and is closed under um, <clears throat> clo closed under evolution. So whatever we are choosing for uh, P and Q, uh, not only that P and Q uh, are um, the special P. But uh, every um, every term that we construct from uh, p par q will eventually end up uh, being the special p. Well, every every term that p par q reduces to. So, not, uh, not... if uh, p and q doesn't reduce, uh, then uh, this is fine. Yeah. Well, well p p par q if that's stuck, right? Then that's by definition in, mm -hmm. in curly P, a script P, whatever you want to call it. Oh, oh, I see. And if they, uh, 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 if they can reduce, they will uh, end up with... Uh, uh, they're still yeah. inside P, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 So, so now we're going to use our notion of annihilation uh, and we say that um, uh, for all R, um, so we say, since P is closed, oh, and I, I have to, I have to insist up here uh, that, uh, sorry, grab these also have to insist one other thing and um, can you spot the one thing I, I missed out the base case okay what is the base case hmm. I'm about to write it so speak now mm. yeah I need this. Okay. <clears throat> okay. We want that zero is in there, and that for all p and q uh, that are in there, p par q is in there, and then we also want for all r such that p par q evolves after some number of steps to r, that r is also in there. Okay. Now. So, so this we will call a P monoid, right? Where this is our composition and that's, that's our identity. What's different about these monoids is that 
the the elements of the monoids can also do this other thing, which is this arrow thing. Does that make sense? Mm. Yes. So it's not just that they have composition, but they also have an arrow. So and what, what is the dot? I'm sorry. The the dot is just such that this is the scope of the quantifier. That's that's the abstraction, and that's the body of the abstraction. Okay, thank you. So, when you say uh, uh, this morning, I also have an uh, have an error. Error um, composition is uh, basically the binary operator. It's the right? bar. Yeah, composition is mm -hmm. bar. Yeah, and, but, uh, but error is you're saying that error is uh, different. Yeah. So so just just like um, mm -hmm. so just like our graphs, right? Our graphs kind of exist at a moment in time. And then they, they disappear unless they refresh themselves. Our monoid elements exist at a moment in time, right? And then they disappear, they change, they wiggle, right? But we want to make sure that whatever they wiggle to, they don't leave P. They don't leave curly P. And you need to say that uh, for composition, this, this is uh, true, right? But for arrow, this doesn't have to be true. This is why you're, you're specifying this. Correct, right. Like, like you, you, mm -hmm. you, could, you could get them in P, but they might not stay in P, right? So you form, you form the chemical, right? So if this is our beaker. We insist that zero is in the beaker. And then whenever you have two molecules, when we put, when we put them in composition, there are also a molecule in the beaker, right? But, but these things can interact. And so they might evaporate and leave the beaker, right? So this is saying that the beaker is closed with respect to that, the chemical action. Oh, I see. Yeah. Now, now, suppose that we have a pair such that whenever we get to R, R eventually gets to zero. Then we call, this is annihilation, but we're now going to call this a funny kind of inverse. Right? These are inverses of each other, but only up to evolution, right? It's not that P par Q is zero, because the only way for that to happen is if both P and Q are zero. We're saying that, that, that you know, the two are zero eventually. So this gives you a P group. Clearly, par is associative, right? So we don't have to worry about that, right? It's a monoid. And we've got this funny notion of inverse, right? So P and Q are inverses of each other, but only, only if, you know, however they evolve, they eventually evaporate. They eventually go to zero. They annihilate each other. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a P group. Um, and in fact, you know, it's commutative, right? Because if P annihilates Q, then Q annihilates P clearly. If, if this is a group, can we can we somehow? Um, but it's not it's not a group. Go, it's not a group. Oh, okay, okay. It's a, P, it's a P group, right? P group. Oh, I see. So we cannot like go full circle and create something. You can create lots of stuff with this structure, but the structure is not the same as a group, right? Mm -hmm. it, we only get to the zero. We only get to the identity eventually. It's not on the nose. In order to get a group, you have to mod out by the behavior. Now, if you think about it, you know, the existing uh, algebra systems that are out there, they're always doing evaluation. So this is closer to what 
and evaluation representation would, you know, some computer representation of a group looks more like this than it does like the, the, the group theoretic specification of a group. When I compose them after I do a bunch of compute, that's this part, then I get to the identity. Does that make sense? Um, so if I'm typing, I'm if I'm typing something into Mathematica or, or some other, you know, system that represents group theory, right? When I when I do my when I do my uh, uh, composition of two group elements, it's it has to do some calculation. That's this part here, before it gets to the answer. Does that make sense? Yes. And uh, are, you, are you saying that uh, uh, when the compiler will try to um, compile the program, it will try to get? Well, I'm thinking more of an interpreter, but yes. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking compiler in the sense that it will try to get to the end. Yeah, yeah, but you know, you, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so now let's do the standard stuff that you want to do with group theory. So suppose that, uh, so what, one thing we'd like to do is, is representations. Okay, so one thing we'd like to do is something like, um, um, you know, uh, representations of permutations. So how about I, um, how about I have some, some, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write um, our permutations like this. So I've got uh, some list of cycles, All right? So I've got, I've got, uh, you know, uh, just as an example, right? So uh, I'd, I'd like to write it down generically, right? So I've got, uh, I'll do it this way. Can we, can we use uh, uh, this group to make some kind of equivalence between P and Q? Because we know that uh, they will reduce in some uh, the same R. Uh, I mean, you can talk. I mean, by simulation is the right notion of equivalence, right? Mm. Mm. All right. So, so I mean, you're you're familiar with the representation of, of permutations, right? <laughs> Um, I cannot say with them too. Okay. Uh, hang on. Okay. So so, it, it, so I've got a list of sigmas, and the the sigmas. So so let, let let's look let's look at one. Oh, well, hang on. I, I I just want to go ahead and write this down, and then we'll go. So 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 suppose that. Uh, so, so what I'll do is for each one of these, um, so this is going to be a big pie, uh, this one here. Oops, not that one. Okay, so that's pi. Let's see if I can do this. Sub i, does that work? Okay. Um, so I, I'm gonna, um, so each one of these is a list of pairs, right? Which is the, uh, ah, the position um, that we, 
are in and the position we go to, right? So, so we, uh, I'll, I'll finish this. I'll give an example and then I'll finish this off. Okay, so imagine I've got a list of n things, okay? Um, then I could, for example, take the first position to the second position and the second position to the fifth position and the fifth position back to the first position, okay? And then three goes to three and uh, let's say four goes to four. So that's a permutation of five things. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, but, uh, and you, you don't need <clears throat> uh, permutations, but uh, you, uh, you can have only, uh, um, you can have less than n elements or, or all, all, always must be n. It's, it's gotta be n, I gotta mm -hmm. do, yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, you can elide the ones that are identities, right? So I can get rid of the three and the four. I just wrote them down so that it was clear. Okay. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. All right. So I can represent every permutation that way, right? That's clear. Okay. So now what we want to do so, so, so therefore a, a list, uh, so, so each sigma is gonna be some cycle, right? All right, and let, let's say that we in, index these cycles in, um, in, 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 in uh, one base counting, right? So this is the sigma one, one, sigma one, two, sigma one, three, right? So um, get rid of that. So then here, what we do is we take um, X, or sorry, Y from where? Well, from uh, Sigma one, one, uh, Sigma one, one right and then um so i take it in from one one and then where does it go to well it goes to one two okay so let's just do that so where does it go it goes out on um x oops Uh, sorry, goes out on uh, sigma one, uh, one, two. Okay, that makes sense. And we we'll just send Y along. Whatever we got in, that's what we send out. And then um, we need to go um, in parallel uh, for um, y from now sigma uh, one, two. Oh, we have to be a little bit careful. Um, yeah, we have to be a little bit careful. Let's polarize these, okay? So let's, um, uh, we, we wanna separate the this one from this one. So I'll go, um, I'll write to negative. So N for the negative version of this and P for the positive, right? So we're making polarized channels, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm just separating them. And the reason I'm separating them is because I don't want this, the, the thing to, uh, to cycle right here. So let me um, give myself a little room. So 
we'll format it here. Okay. Yeah. And you're you're shadowing the Y. Um, because no, I'm not. No, it's inside. It's inside of a separate four comprehension. Right. This is a separate Y from that one. Right. That that Y is all done. Now, obviously, if inside oh. this body, inside this body, if I mention a Y, that Y is going to be this one, not that one. Uh, but I don't see the end of uh, the first four. Doesn't matter, right? This is inside this one. This Y will be a separate okay. Y from that one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So then this one, uh, so, so then here, we want to do the negative of one, two, right? So this becomes the two. Oops. Uh, oh, I can grab it that way. Uh, and um, and then where do we put it? We put it on the uh, on one three, right? In parallel with dot dot, so this becomes one three. Right, and then we 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 keep doing this process out to the length of out, out to the length of the the sigma one, right? And we do this for each of the sigmas, mm -hmm. right? And then, but the notice that this is a parallel composition. So let me close this one up. All right, so that's that's that one. Um, yeah, that's correct. I got the, I got the braces correct. There, so there's that. And then we'll put this down here. Oh my God, I didn't ask it to do that. <laughs> okay there we go and then that goes on the inside and then so that one closes that one and this one closes that one okay you see so so now we've got the equivalent of the symmetry the the permutations extended in time Right, so each sigma will be nested, and then the across the sigmas they'll be in par. Does that make sense? Mm, yes. So why, why did you nest the four? Because we have the we have the n and p stuff, right? So you, you need not worry about uh, nesting them. A inside B inside C. Like the fours are nested, right? But you have the N and P, so I thought that's well, that's working as an identifier. Right. Um, uh, uh, the, the, it's a good question. There are some subtleties about how you interpret that. You can you can play around with the representation um, at your leisure to see all the different ones. But now here's a question, an open question. I haven't solved it. Is it the case that all P groups are of this form? Because every group has a representation like this. Every finite group has a representation like this. Is it the case that all finite P groups have a representation like this? If not, that says that P groups are very different than groups. And if so, isn't that interesting? We've now, we now have a normal form for P groups. Yeah. 
Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. So this, so, so we, we can, we can recapitulate a lot of mathematics in this style. So with the Fano plane work, I showed how to do it for, for graphs. Here, I'm showing how to do it for groups. This is cool to me. This is, this is what makes process algebra so interesting because they're very different than mathematics. Mathematics is static, right? But processes wiggle. And when you say uh, uh, the processes wiggle, or, or um, so with an, with an, this is the arrow that, that uh, uh, is different from um, like yeah. a normal definition of a group. That's correct. And, mm -hmm. Are you are you saying that um, is the every group finite? The the, the curly group here. Uh, I mean the the usual definition of a group. Oh no, you can have infinite and groups. Lee, Lee groups are infinite, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. So can I just to clarify the fourth uh, thing that P uh, perpendicular? I don't know what you call that symbol. Q. I is, just, I just, I, P annihilates Q. P annihilates Q. Uh, can you just uh, read it out once uh, so that I understand what's going on there? Uh, just once more. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we say that P annihilates Q. Alternatively, Q annihilates P. It doesn't matter. It's commutative. If and only if. For any R that P par Q can reach after some number of steps, that R eventually evolves to zero. Which means all paths, all evaluation paths out of P par Q go to zero. So they eat each other up. So I have another question, just slightly related. So uh, to this, which is uh, for every p, does it imply that there exists a q such that uh, like p and q annihilate? Uh, yeah. Yeah. In order to be the p group, you have to have the you have to complete you have to complete it under you have to have a you have to close it under annihilation to be a p group. So, so Roland, uh, as we have currently defined it, does not satisfy this property, or no, it right doesn't. No, 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 no. You don't. Ah. That's that's why I pick a, a curly p. Achha. So so Roland needs to be ex extended, like as we currently have it. No, needs to be no, extended no, no, no. to no, satisfy you, this property. No, you'd you'd pick a subset of Roland terms. This is this is a smaller universe than Roland. That's why this has a chance of being a normal form for curly peas. So this is something I was thinking about because there in, in Roland there are certain things that like persistence cannot be uh, cannot be annihilated. So uh, I was thinking that Roland at, at the stage at which we have defined it does you don't have full control over memory. If you put something in memory, there are certain things you cannot delete. So I thought uh, that. I don't know if that's desirable or not, but I was thinking about like sh should Roland have such a property? Like, yeah. Again, what what you do is you pick a small a subset of Roland, not uh, not extending Roland. So your subset is actually you don't allow for persistence. You only allow for for uh, for things where you you either recurse or you branch off to annihilation. Right. So every every everything that has a persistence definition, you you change it to a definition where you 
could recurse or you could branch. And the branch goes to the zero. That's how that's how you that's how you get persistence that annihilates. You see what, you see what I'm saying? Yes, yes, I, I follow what you're saying. Cool. So since you mentioned branch, I had another question. So what is the type of the match? As we understand it in Rolang, what is the type of the match construction that we use? Yeah, match can be encoded in par and for comprehensions. This is a well-known result. Yeah. Okay, that, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, fine, I, I'll think about that. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, All right, it's uh, 8.01, time for Dev yeah. so I will... Okay. Uh, uh, well, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. And I will see you next week. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, thank you.